Hey everyone, Chris and Jer are here once again. Last time we were here, we were saying hopefully by the time people were watching the video, the Canucks would have qualified for the playoffs mm -hmm. officially. It's happened. They've mm -hmm. also clinched home ice advantage. We also had some good feedback that some people really like the hockey talk. You know who likes the Canucks and sometimes goes to games is Kevin and Carly. And they sent us a picture of their small group and I'm in it. I'm it's, kind of... It's sweet how they put I've, you in there. What do you, I've been pasted in yeah. and everyone's looking yeah. at me other than Kevin who's looking away which hurts just a little yeah that's fair uh but Kevin and Carly were in our first ever online small group uh back in the day so we love them we love them and shout uh, out their group shout out to you uh we were in a text on Sunday the gospel of Mark why don't we you were. read it Mark chapter 3 verses 20 through 29 I'm going to read it and uh it's a beauty and very interesting story then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Chris, help us understand this text a little bit better, please. Well, we both spoke on it it's on true. Sunday, uh, and the message was were me saying, it you know, before I had to preach it. So, right. I trust guess that you so. can again. The uh, messages were the same, but also a little different. I talked about three things. I talked about the psychology of belief. Yeah. I talked about the reality of Satan. And I talked about the unforgivable sin. And the reason I talked about the psychology of belief was because of how the religious leaders respond to Jesus's healings and his exorcisms, his right. casting out of demons. Uh, they can't deny what Jesus is doing, his acts of power. They're public events witnessed by large crowds also witnessed by these religious leaders themselves. And so they don't deny the acts of power. What they do is attribute Jesus's power to Satan, right. to the prince of demons, which is really, really intriguing because I think sometimes we say, you know, I would follow Jesus if I had enough evidence. Right. Um, and what counts as evidence? Well, maybe a miracle something like that. But the reality is if we don't want to follow Jesus, even a miracle m might not be enough, right? right. Like any, a miracle is presented to our senses. We can always doubt our senses. And that's what we will always do if we don't want to follow Jesus and let him kind of run our lives. And so I guess when I read this text, I'm reminded that we're very complex individuals. Yeah. You know, we're... Yeah. Um, it's hard to know ourselves at times. Uh, if we don't want to believe, we can resist belief even with evidence right in front of us. On the other hand, if we do want to believe, we can believe without seeing an exorcism or some kind of dramatic answer to prayer or a miracle. God gives us grace to believe and we believe and we follow. And so talked about the psychology of belief a bit um, because of the religious leaders and their response to Jesus. Uh, and that led into a conversation around the reality of Satan because they attribute Jesus's power to Satan rather than God. And Jesus has a strong response to their interpretation of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think within it um, is really an a really important theological declaration uh, about who God is and how the kingdom of God works. Um, but then, but then he, he, it says that he speaks in, in parables. Why don't you talk a bit about what he's saying in response? Well, I, Jesus is just doing some like elementary logic. Really. He's like responding right. to the, the, uh, the statement of the religious leaders that by Satan's power, he's casting out Satan. And he just goes, look, that doesn't make sense. 
Sure. Right. Like if Satan casts out Satan, his house can't stand. Um, you know, it's like um, the Canucks are in the playoffs. And mm. so if two of the defensemen decide they yeah. want to play for the if other team. Juleson, Susie. Yeah. If Juleson and Susie go, yeah. you know what? I don't want to win this series. I'm going to play for who are we playing now? Doesn't work. It's yeah. not going to work. We're not going to win. A house divided against no. itself won't stand. That's Jesus' point. It is. Yeah. And then he goes, he gives this word of real hope and encouragement. He says, calls Satan the strong man and says, I've bound him up to plunder yeah. his house. And it's just this idea that Jesus is victorious over the demonic and through his cross, he's won a decisive victory, struck a decisive blow against the kingdom wow. of darkness. So cool. And that we have that confidence and hope as followers of Jesus. And there is this reality that we planted a church to pick a fight with the strong, that we are joining Jesus as king, uh, following in his ways, pushing back darkness by his grace. Yeah, and I think I mentioned that the text makes a real theological declaration what i'm what i mean is that one thing i love about this story is that it shows that jesus is highlighting the fact that there's no darkness in god at all mm -hmm. that it's not like this thing like oh maybe you know maybe there's this bit of evil in god that might be something that people wonder about and jesus is just clearing it out and going nope there's a clear enemy against what's good <laughs> god is good and there's there's no darkness in him, in him at all. Um, there's no there's no bit of Satan. There's no bit of evil in him. That's our enemy we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I love that he draws that line and makes that clear um, mm -hmm. for us in the text. I remember I was uh, leading a leadership retreat at my last church, and the night before I had this dream. And in the dream, I was on a cruise ship, and I was walking on the deck, and people were like hanging out, drinking, swimming and having a good time relaxing and we were going through like a narrow channel and up ahead on each side of the channel there was like artillery huh. and these huge cannons pointing at us getting huh. ready to sink the ship and i remember kind of like yelling at people and no one was paying attention and there was a sense of like helpless you know helplessness and frustration in the dream and then i woke up and i immediately had like the interpretation of the wow. dream it was like That's a cool. warning birthed out of love that in the dream everyone thought they were on a cruise when in reality we were in the middle of a conflict um and we're not prepared for enemy fire and the same thing can happen in the church we think we're yeah. you know comfortable we're complacent we think we're on a cruise ship but we're really in the middle of a conflict a spiritual battle our battle is not against people it's not against flesh and blood it's against the powers and principalities demonic forces um, and so we need to be aware of that reality. Well, yeah. I think about the Hunger Games and mm -hmm. that moment. It's like Katniss, remember who the real enemy is. Mm -hmm. And may that be a word. I didn't see that coming. For the church. No, it's it's so important that we're like, hey, remember where the battle lies. Remember when Katniss <laughs> substitutes herself for Prim, her sister Primrose, yeah. and willingly, you know, enters the arena on her behalf. Doesn't it have gospel. some gospel resonance there? Yes. How many youth pastors do you think you, I think we wrote that into the Alpha Youth Film Series, yeah, dude, yeah. as like a type of, anyways. So many podcasts, we could start a hockey podcast. We could start a, you know, we probably connecting will. film and theology. Well, you're now done your master's, so you got some spare time. Yeah. We'll start a lot of podcasts. I'm trying to figure out what to do. Anyways, so then there's the third part of the talk on the unforgivable sin, which yes, it's pretty serious actually. Yeah, so, the blasphemy but let of me the Holy Spirit. let me read a quote that's going to do all the work for us. I think we need that because I think there's some um, uh, being a pastor for 15 years, occasionally run into Christians with very sensitive conscience. Uh, sensitive conscience who maybe even in a moment of pain or frustration or darkness cursed God or told God what they thought about them, about him, you know, and um, were worried they committed this sin. And so right, right. context matters so it much. Does. It's all connected. Everything that's happening in the story is connected to the religious leaders attributing the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus to demonic forces. Yes. Right. Okay. And so this is Daniel L. Atkin. I'm sure we'll have the quote up on the screen. Uh, the unpardonable sin is to knowingly, willingly, and persistently attribute to Satan the hmm. works of God. 
done by and in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit who testifies to these truths in your heart. It is a sin of full knowledge. It's an ongoing disposition of the heart that's actually reflected in the Greek. Not this moment of like, oh, just anger or frustration or, or whatever where you, you know, give God sure. a piece of your mind. Yeah. This ongoing disposition of the heart that resists the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a verbal act that attributes the works of the Holy Spirit to Satan. It's very specific and contextualized to this story, right? And and not just about a moment of doing that, mm-hmm. but doing that in an ongoing sense. Like it's like Jesus warning them, mm-hmm. hey, this path. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's a willful rejection of God's grace in Jesus that's key, rooted in unbelief. It's a sin a Christian cannot commit. And it's a sin not committed by one who's concerned that he may have committed it, right? Like that's pretty important. Yeah. The person who's like, yeah. Oh no, have I have I sinned this way against God? Has a tender, sensitive heart, not a yeah. hardened, calloused heart to the work of the Spirit right or on. the things of God. And really the unforgivable sin, like even in the text, it says every blasphemy or slander people utter can be forgiven or will yeah. be forgiven. Okay, why? Uh, because of Jesus's atoning death on the cross. Yeah, and yeah. so the unforgivable sin is to reject the one who's come to forgive right. all of our sins right. and the spirit of God who testifies to his finished work on the cross. And so yeah. I think one of my prayers in response to this is like, God, keep my heart tender yeah. to your word, to the movement of the spirit, yeah. to signs of your kingdom all around 100%, me. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Thanks so much for that, Chris. And we're going to throw it to you for conversation. Encourage you to read that text again. It's not very long. And to consider it and then the other discussion questions that we sent you. We'll talk soon.